child is announced, it brings great joy. Or in this case, as was just read, the prediction of the coming of Jesus. We saw earlier, uh, read from another section of Luke, that whenever the, uh, his actual birth was announced, it brought great joy. But whenever a child is born, you know, we can't wait to meet this child as they grow older, as their personality develops. What is this child going to be like? And as we see in God's Word, there were predictions of Jesus. There were announcements of uh, when He was born and the great joy that that brings. As we consider the announcement of the Savior, it multiplies the joy as far as what He brings into this world. And what we're going to be looking at this morning are some of the things that are, that are found in that passage that was just read for us in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and following. Because in in looking at the announcement that Jesus was to be born, that a Savior is coming into the world, there were several things that Mary was told ahead of time that she could know about who this was going to be. What's He going to accomplish? What was foretold about Jesus in that setting? What did she know about who He would become? We're going to be looking at several of those this morning. First, as we get into this, she, uh, she was told what His name would be. There in Luke chapter 1 in our text, In verse 31, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Now that's significant because as we see throughout Scripture, the names that are given to people throughout the Bible have significance. You study the names of God throughout the Old Testament. There's great significance to them because they tell us about His character. They tell us who He is, what He's done. The same is with this name, Jesus. It tells what He will accomplish. Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 to 23. And this is, as Joseph is being addressed, it says, She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. The reason for his name, the significance of his name, she was told, you will bear a son and name him Jesus. The significance of that tells us about who he's going to be, what he's going to accomplish, what purpose he has in coming into the world. Because that word Jesus, that name Jesus means... Jehovah is salvation. It signifies what he is getting ready to accomplish in his life, what he will be, what he will mean not just to that family, but to all of mankind. That through him, the salvation, the blessing that was promised, went all the way back to Abraham, will be brought about in this child. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Peter said, There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven that's been given among men by which we must be saved. Salvation, that great gift that comes from God, only comes through Jesus Christ. His name, she knew He would be named Jesus. His name indicates the gift that He would bring, indicates what He's going to do, what God will accomplish through Him and Jesus Himself even said as much. You know, we're all familiar with John chapter 3 and verse 16. But let's look at John chapter 3 and verse 17. We know that just before this, he said that, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Through Jesus, Jehovah is salvation. He fulfills the promise that was made in the very beginning. You remember when God created everything that there is, and He placed Adam and Eve there in the garden. Instead of all the trees in the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree in the middle of it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat you will surely die. Well, and as we know, in Genesis chapter 3, that serpent came along and 
said to Eve, you surely will not die. And she looked at the, looked at the fruit and it looked good. And so she took it and ate it. And as God was driving the man and the woman out of the garden, at one point he turned and spoke to the serpent. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, and predicts that there is one coming. He says to the serpent in this context, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Satan would, would strike a blow at the one who's coming. However, the Messiah, there is one coming that God promises that serpent, that God promised the enemy will strike a fatal blow to him. And that's exactly what Jesus did, that God sent Jesus into the world to be the one to deal that death blow to Satan, to bring salvation through defeating the devil and his works. Paul writes that Jesus came so that we could be adopted into God's family. God sent his Son, Jesus, into the world that you and I might become the children of God. What a gift. You know, I know that there's been a lot of kids that are here this morning that have been up opening presents this morning. But what we're talking about here in Scripture is the greatest gift. The greatest thing that could ever be given. And it's what God has given us in Jesus Christ in Galatians 4. Beginning in verse 4, it says, When the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that, they, that, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth his, the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. God gave us the greatest gift in sending Jesus Christ into the world. Because as signified by His name, there's salvation through Him. There's a way back to God through Him. There is fellowship with God through Him and only through Him. Mary was told, you'll bear a son and we'll call His name Jesus. Joseph was told, you'll call His name Jesus for He will save His people from their sins. In that name, there is great significance. In that name, there is purpose. In that name, there is meaning. In that name, is salvation. She was told He will be named Jesus. But she was told a bit more about Him as well. She was told that He will be the Son of the Highest or the Son of the Most High. Let's go back to the Gospel of Luke now. That's found in, in verse 32 of our text, but I want to read from chapter 2 of the Gospel of Luke. Because we see something here that's a little bit different. You know, we see He will be the Son of the Most High. Where's the Son of God going to be born? Well, we think about, you know, what would make sense to us in the greatest palace, the biggest castle, the best healthcare facility that there is to make sure everything goes smoothly, to make sure that he has the best of the best. But whenever we get to chapter 2 of Luke, it says, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee to the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. You may think about whenever kings of this earth have their children, they're, they're born in the best health care facilities, born into the place, you know, places that you know, we think, well, that would make sense. They're in the nicest of places. But that word there translated manger, you know, we think about manger you know, in, our, in our culture. 
We've kind of romanticized this idea of a manger, but that, that term in the Greek, it, it literally means he was laid in a feeding trough. A child of God born and laid in a feeding trough. Not what we would consider ideal. Probably didn't smell the best. Because after all, that's where the animals were fed. You know, we contrast that with, you know, we think about births today, we want the sanitary conditions in the hospital, but when the Son of God came, He was born in the most humble of circumstances. And this humility can be seen throughout His life. You know, it didn't stop there. He was born in a humble family into a family with, of humble means. But what God saw to it was that it wasn't about the physical riches they had, but about who they were in character. Because as we read about Mary and as we read about Joseph, God sent His Son into a family of people who would obey Him. When you read about Joseph, particularly over in Matthew's account, as God gives Joseph commands again and again and again, I want you to do this, and it says the very next thing, Joseph obeyed over and over. And as was read for us before in Luke chapter 1, Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done according to... Uh, done to me according to your word. We see the beauty of this family not in their physical means, but in their character, in their service to the Lord. And we see a humility in the part of Jesus throughout his life. Paul wrote to the Philippians that <clears throat> in looking at the character of Jesus as the uh, as the reasoning or as the motivation for them to be uh, unified, for them the way that they were to behave towards one another in humility. He explains to them how they're to be selfless, how they're to be humble, but Jesus is the example of that. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although He existed in the form of God, did not regard, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself. The Son of God. God in the flesh, who is in the form of God, but He came to this earth. He took the form of a, uh, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. God Almighty wrapped Himself in human flesh. He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death on the cross. For this reason, God has highly exalted Him, bestowed on Him a name that is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess because of who Jesus is. Because He humbled Himself. He is exalted. It's His humility that makes Him great. It's what He teaches. The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. And as He taught His disciples, he told him, the greatest among you is your servant. We see a humility in Jesus throughout his life, which from a worldly perspective is quite ironic because he's the Son of God. God in the flesh. I find kind of an interesting point here as we read there in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, it says that he was born during the reign of Augustus Caesar. Augustus, you see, from... The Roman perspective was declared divine. Declared to be the son of a God, but the actual son of God was born during the reign of one who was pretending to be. The real son of God came in a very different kind of circumstance. And as we read earlier in Matthew 1 and 23, his name Emmanuel means God with us. Jesus' divinity was established before His birth. It was foretold before His birth. She, uh, Mary was told there in our text, in Luke chapter 1, He'll be the Son of the Most High, the Son of the Highest. And it fulfills prophecy as foretold by Isaiah the prophet in chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. A child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. The government will rest on His shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. 
there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. She was told his name, which signifies salvation, told that he'll be the Son of God. And we see that throughout Scripture, that he is God in the flesh, that he is the Son of the Most High, but also that he will be the Son of David. Legally speaking, prophetically speaking, the rightful king. Son of David indicates that Jesus was the prophesied Messiah inasmuch as the Messiah was prophesied to come from David's lineage. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, David has made a promise. It's in this context is where David has expressed a desire to build a house for the Lord, and the Lord has kind of turned it around at that point and said, I'm going to build you a house, David. And it's in the context that he prophesies what's coming, that the Lord, or that God foretells to David what's coming. He says there in 2 Samuel 7, verses 11 and 12. Even from that day I commanded judges to be over my people. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. And the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. And when your days are completed and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up Raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. Now this passage in 2 Samuel is picked up and by New Testament writers and quoted and applied to Jesus. Both Matthew and Luke show through genealogy that Jesus meets this requirement that he is the descendant of David that He is the rightful Messiah, that He is of the tribe of Judah, that He is the rightful King. Peter picked that up in Acts chapter 2. and explains that He uses David's writing, He uses David's words to show that Jesus is the Messiah who is seated on at the right hand of God. In Acts 2, beginning in verse 29, he says, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Peter there is quoting from the 132nd Psalm that one of the descendants of David would be on his throne. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus, God raised up again, to, w to which we are all witnesses. And so Peter is saying, here's what David prophesied, here's who the Messiah is supposed to be, and here's what God did, and here are twelve men standing before you who have all seen it. God raised him from the dead. He didn't stay in the tomb, and he said to them, David wasn't talking about himself, and being there in Jerusalem, he could point over, to where the tomb of David would be. Because you see, David was buried in Jerusalem. His tomb is still here. It's not him. It's this Jesus. God raised up. Verse 33, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says... The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He's at the right hand of God. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the King. He is on the throne. He is exactly where God said he would be. He is exactly where he was foretold there in Luke chapter 1, whenever Mary was told he will be the son of David. He'll be king on the throne of David. But it's not just that he will be the king. He will be king forever. In contrast to all of the other rulers that there have ever been. In our text, that comes from verse 33, or Luke chapter 1 and verse 33.
He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Other rulers are temporary. His rule is permanent. The Caesars that we read about, none of them are still on the throne. The Herods who cause so much trouble are all gone. Our own presidents serve for a time, but then are not in power anymore. Jesus is on the throne forever. And that's what was foretold. Again, if we go back to 2 Samuel 7, the very next verse there in verse 13, from the text that we were looking at just a moment ago, that's what David was told. That this descendant, this Messiah, this one that God was going to raise up, His descendant, verse 13, He will build a house for My name and I will establish the throne of His kingdom forever. Jesus will build this house for God and will reign forever. What is God's house? Paul tells us that exactly. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, he said, I'm writing so that you'll know how to conduct yourself in the household of the living God, which is the church. You see, Jesus is our king. Jesus is the one who is our ruler, the one that we follow, the one that we listen to. The temple in the Old Testament was considered the house of God. The house of God today is His church. God dwells among His people, among those who are saved. He's put His Spirit within you when you obey the gospel, when you're united with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He puts His Spirit within you. You become the temple of His Spirit. You become the temple of the Lord. You become that holy place where God Himself dwells. When you submit yourself to King Jesus, the one who reigns forever, just as Daniel predicted, Jesus established the kingdom that Daniel predicted would last forever. That kingdom which would be greater than all of the other kingdoms that ever have or ever will exist. Jesus is that King forever. He's our prophesied Savior. You'll name Him Jesus. He's God in the flesh, the Son of the Most High, the King of kings, who's on the throne of David, who will reign forever. And because of what He's done, what kind of king this is we serve, what kind of gift this is that God gave to mankind in sending Jesus here. You know, we think about rulers, many times we think about those who are imposing their, uh, or they're imposing their overbearing, but when we think about Jesus and what He's done, He came to serve our greatest need. The Apostle John writes that as many as receive Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe in His name. Through Jesus, we've been given a right to be part of God's family. We've been given a right to be in fellowship with God. And so today as we spend time with our families, as we open gifts and we think about all of these neat things that we've received or all of these neat things that we get to give to other people, let's not forget the greatest gift that's ever been given and that is still available today. The gift of Jesus and the gift of salvation that comes only through Him. God has given us the greatest gift, but it's up to us to accept it. Will we be united with Him? Will we choose to follow King Jesus? You have that opportunity today. What better gift to get? 
In a day when everybody's focused on getting and receiving gifts, you can receive the greatest gift today in forgiveness of sins. If you'll choose to follow Jesus today, if you'll choose to put your faith in Him by obeying Him, by being united with Him in the waters of baptism. You come confessing your belief in Him as the Messiah. Choosing to turn away from sin, you can receive the gift of salvation when you're immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins and you will become the temple of His Holy Spirit who He gives you. Or if you need to recommit yourself to following King Jesus this morning, we'll pray for you, encourage you however we can, but if we can help you in some way, would you come while we stand and while we sing?